what we have here is a, a myth which has been literalized. Once you see that, then the whole history starts to fall into a new pattern. People think, oh, why would anyone write a myth? But it's the language of the ancient world. So it's like asking, why do people write science fiction stories? Why did someone make The Matrix? Well, because it's a powerful story which transforms you when you come into contact with it. And it is made up of little motifs which have been taken from all over the place, put together in a new order. Well, that's what myth is in the ancient world. That's what the Jesus story is. Once literalist Christianity had been adopted by the Roman Empire, it... It was forced, almost, by its own logic, to turn on the ancient mysteries. Because once you've got this idea that one man has come and is literally the Son of God, and you must literally believe in that history to be saved, well, you're almost duty-bound to enforce it. And the tolerance, spiritual tolerance, which marked out the ancient world, ended. And the pagan mysteries were eradicated, uh, the Jews were attacked, and the other forms of Christianity, Gnostic Christianity, were also eradicated and, and their books burnt. And, you know, in some ways, the head, the intellectual head, was cut off the, the Western world. It collapsed, really, and the heart was torn out too. When literalist Christianity turned on the ancient traditions, what we're witnessing really is the collapse of the Western world and the entry into what we appropriately call the Dark Ages. Every culture in the ancient Mediterranean seems to have taken this perennial myth which probably originated in Egypt or could be so old it's Neolithic and has made it its own, turned, had its own version and what we see happening is that the story of Joshua or Jesus becomes merged with this pagan story of a pagan dying and resurrecting God man. So we know for instance in Alexandria which is the New York of the ancient world it's full of, 25% uh, of the population is Jewish. They all, they're speaking Greek. Greek is the universal language. And we know that they're putting together Jewish mythology with pagan mythology because we have lots of these texts, which are called intertestamental texts, because they fall between the Old and the New Testament, which are clearly mythological texts which have got, show a pagan Jewish crossover. If you free yourself from your preconditioning, and you pick up the gospel story, you can clearly see that this is another one. These pagan myths have been merged with the mysteries of Moses and Joshua, which told the story of going to the Promised Land, which was a Gnostic initiatory myth for the Jews, which is then being mixed with this pagan story. It's a quirk of history that we're not here discussing whether there was and wasn't a real Mithras because very nearly Mithraism, which is a Persian cult, you know, which is again a foreign cult to the Roman Empire, became the dominant cult in, in, across the whole of the ancient world under the Romans. Uh, they tried that. They tried numbers of, you didn't go straight to Christianity, they tried numbers of things which didn't, didn't gel, didn't work. Each emperor would come across with their own thing. And this is how, partly how all of this un, uh, began to, um, the traditional history fell to bits, was that in the, after the Reformation, Protestant scholars were looking at the Catholic Church, which they just split from, and going, hang on, all of these uh, rites and rituals and, and the, the, the Pope, and this is all pagan. And so it was, it started with the Reformation, and, and, and you then had, for the first time, scholars actually examining the texts, free to do it, and examining the rituals. For them, they were looking for the real Jesus and were peeling away what they thought were accretions to find the real man. All that's happened is that Peter, Gandhi, and I, and other scholars have carried on that tradition, I mean, Albert Schweitzer, you know, his great example, and gone right down and gone, do you know what? You keep going and there's no one underneath this. Once I got over the shock of having, you know, being part of our, the most famous man who ever lived didn't. <laughs> Once you got your head around that, uh, what, I, what I found was that there was this incredible depth of mystical wisdom available to, for me through the Western tradition, which I hadn't been able to see before. And that, you know, the paradox is that if there's a real, if there is a man underneath it, then he is probably not the man that you think or I think. Because everyone's got a different Jesus, haven't they?
you know, it's Jews have a rabbi Jesus, Hindu think he's an avatar, a lot of people think he's a, a Buddha figure, especially Buddhists. You know, it's like the, everyone, you know, the Muslims think, they think he's a, a prophet like Muhammad, maybe not quite as good. You know, it's like they, everyone's got their own Jesus. We approach often the, looking for the real Jesus, it seems to me, like we're, just, you know, like we're just taking a chocolate out of a chocolate box. It's like, which one do I fancy? You know, oh, I'll have Jesus the Son of God. Oh, you know, I can't swallow that. Uh, you know, let's have a nutty one. Jesus was a spaceman. You know, I'll have that. That's what we do. But what we need to do is actually look at the evidence. And when you look at the evidence, there really is no Jesus there. So for the Gnostics, they are carrying the real tradition. The literalists are an imitation church. They, they, they see it. One, one lovely line I love is a church full of bishops. It's like it's, an, it's about authority. It's about people setting themselves up. It's it not dissimilar to today. It's never, you know, it's always the same, isn't it? There's individuals who come into spirituality because they want to awaken themselves and each other to a state of oneness and love. And there's other people who are interested in setting themselves up with a bunch of followers, making a good living, having a little cult. And the Gnostics saw the literalist church, the one that would become the Roman, uh, the, uh, Roman Catholic Church, as that, as an authoritarian structure designed to, to fleece people. What I see with the Jesus story is a very old, powerful, beautiful Gnostic myth, an initiatory allegory about Gnosis which starts as wisdom sayings and a basic myth, which becomes fleshed out and put into a geographical and historical setting. And at some point, there are some serious political overlays which will benefit the uh, Roman world. So that when it becomes the property of the Roman Empire, uh, it can manipulate it to its own ends. We've been so conditioned to think of paganism as some benighted superstition and then along comes this incredible revelation of Christianity the truth is much better actually the ancient world was full of everything you think of it a bit like you know, India or somewhere maybe today you know you've got every form of thing happening but within it you've got this incredibly powerful philosophical tradition I mean don't forget the ancient world gave us mathematics science uh, architecture I mean this is a high culture and therefore no surprise that its spirituality is also highly developed and that's what once you understand that you can see that that it's not it's not to belittle Christianity it's actually to make a link back to its very beautiful, powerful, profound ancient heritage. And then Christianity takes on a new shape and form. It's not this thing which replaces something, it's like a flowering of something. I think there's two things that need to happen in spirituality. One is we need to go back like psychotherapy and sort out the past, get clear, realize that we've kind of been caught up in false memory syndrome. We haven't seen the way things actually were. And then we can let go of literalism. We can let go of blind belief that somebody did it for us. The idea, the horrendous idea, that if you don't believe this, you'll be tortured forever when you die by a god of love. You know, this crazy stuff. And instead move into a new form of experiential, direct experience. Now, the Gnostic tradition was elitist in the past. It was for the few. I think what's happening now is it's, it's not like that. This is available for more and more people that more and more people spontaneously and naturally are having this awakening occur. And we are continuing a evolutionary current of which the ancient pagans, the Pythagoreans were a part, the ancient Egyptians were a part, the Gnostics were a part, and it's come through and we're still continuing that thread today. And if we can honor that thread and make that journey, then we can create a more loving and a more unified world.